Making delicious meals from home canned foods is what makes the work of putting it all away worth it. And today I'm gonna to show you two of our recent meals featuring items that I can back during Canuary. If you're new to canning, the speed at which these meals come together might just push you to get started. And if you're a seasoned canner, I hope you find inspiration in my twist on two classic meals. Join me as I pull a can of pork, chicken, tomato sauce, and potatoes off the shelf and make two amazing meals that my entire family loved. My original meal plan for this day was actually chicken enchiladas, but as the day progressed, I hadn't had time to make my tortillas and I didn't want to make a store run. Pinterest for the win as I found this awesome recipe for enchilada soup, which I will link below. I did make some changes, but I'll make sure to point those out as we get through this recipe. To get started, I'm first going to make my own homemade enchilada sauce using tomato sauce that I canned back in January from tomatoes that I have frozen in the freezer from the fall. I tend to only can ingredients instead of finished products because I love the flexibility that allows me to just change what I want to do all year long. Today we're going to start off with enchilada sauce and I am making my own from tomato sauce that I put away back in January from tomatoes that I had left over from the fall. I tend to not can finished products like an enchilada sauce, a pasta sauce, or even a tomato soup. I like to just go with simple tomato sauce because that gives me the flexibility to make whatever I want all season long. I know everybody's different on this, but for me, when I want to put stuff away, just the quick and easy sauce makes this a really easy way to go. So to make the enchilada sauce, use a 15 ounce can of tomato sauce or tomato puree, two thirds cup of chicken broth, three quarters teaspoon of cumin, a half teaspoon of chipotle chili powder, a half teaspoon of onion powder, a half teaspoon of dried oregano, quarter teaspoon of garlic, a pinch of sugar, and some salt. Now I went ahead and pulled my chicken stock straight out of the jar of chicken that I'm going to be using to prepare the soup a little bit later. So to get started, this sauce is going into the pan and then I'm gonna pull some of the stock that I had in the chicken jar straight out of that and pour it into the pan with the tomato sauce. Now, as you'll see in a minute, when I was straining some of this off, I did get a couple chunks of chicken inside the enchilada sauce, so I did go ahead and strain them back out. Once I did that, I gave it a really good stir and added all my seasonings, letting it simmer on the stove until it thickened while I prepared the rest of the ingredients for the meal. Next up is time to chop up all of the ingredients needed for the soup. Now, if you've spent any time on my channel, you know that I am rarely alone in the kitchen. We have five beautiful kids and I have a lot of help when I have a project going on. My tiniest helper is the one that came in today. She could not wait to get involved and she's taking great care to watch and make sure and she often tells me to be careful when I'm cutting things like this. My biggest hope is that with her level of observation, when it's her turn to hold the knife, she will know exactly what she needs to do in order to be safe and keep herself protected. Uh, time will tell on that, but everyone else has turned out pretty good with the knife so far, so I'm hoping she follows suit. Now, as for the recipe, it actually calls for one whole onion chopped but the onion that I had was really huge. So I just kind of take that as a general guide and cut up about as much as I would have in a normal onion that I pick up from the store. Now, definitely feel free to make any recipe just fit best for your family. If you have a smaller onion or if you have extra, don't hesitate just to customize to your liking and that way you're gonna get a product that is gonna be best for your family in the end. The next step in the preparation process is to get some corn ready to go. Now, the easiest way to do this is just to have frozen corn already cut off the cob in your freezer, but I actually have corn left over from a year ago last summer, and I need to get it used up. When we got this corn initially back in the summer of 2022, we preserved it in three different ways because we had a ton of corn. So we went ahead and canned some, which was really great and super easy and would have been a great add to this recipe. The second method was just to freeze it in the stocks completely unshucked in feed bags like you get from a feed store. That turned out awesome and we still love eating it as regular corn on the cob today. And then the third method was what you're seeing here. 
I cut off the ends, cleaned off some of the husk, and went ahead and put it in vacuum seal bags in order to hopefully have easy corn on the cob down the road. This was not the best. It's just not near as crispy as the stuff that we froze in the feed sacks, so we will not be doing this going forward, but I still have these last four ears left, and I wanted to go ahead and get them used up. So with using the running water over the frozen corn, I was easily able to pull the silks off, and you can see those there, and then I just went ahead and cut the corn off of the individual cobs so that we were able to utilize it and get these cobs out of the way and out of the freezer once and for all. With the corn out of the way, the next step is to rinse and drain a jar of black beans. I just have to say, after going to home canned beans, I don't think I can ever go back to the store-bought option. The store-bought just seemed to have a little bit different taste. Now I purchased 25 pound bags of beans from Azure and I will run about 20 plus jars at a time through my different canners in order to keep my pantries full. This includes all different forms, so I will do um, kidney beans, black beans, as well as pinto beans all at the same time. And it's a really big help to boosting those pantry shelves. The last item needing prepped for this soup is this garlic. Now, if you keep pre-chopped garlic already minced in the refrigerator, you can obviously save a little bit of time here. I have been known to do that many times in the past, but right now I still have a ton of garlic actually left that's holding really well in my pantry from last year's growing season. And so I'm just getting it chopped up here so I can add it into the soup. Once the chopping was complete, we moved on to finishing up the seasoning blend for the soup itself. Now, sometimes I've been known to just throw these into the pot one at a time and keep the extra dish clean, but I actually find it a lot easier to get one bowl put together and dump them all in as long as my tiny assistant here is in the mix. Now, she does love to help. And I'm trying to show her here how to hold the spoon and get it in there. We always spill a little bit, but she just really loves it. And I love having her around. After squeezing in a few quick lessons on how to make sure she gets her spoon leveled off and how to get the right end in the jar that we're using, we got this wrapped up and we moved on to the next portion of the recipe. Now, again, if you are interested in the full recipe, you can click the description and it'll have all the details on the spices, the seasonings, and the amounts needed for each down below. When I was editing, I actually came across this footage. I didn't know she was doing this at the time. I was actually washing my hands on the other side of the sink and come back to find her really enjoying those spices. This came with a quick conversation about how spicy that chipotle could be, and I quickly moved her off, followed by washing her own hands. But again, it's all fun in the kitchen. Now at this point, I just wanted to check on that sauce that was simmering down over on the stove. It looked really good, so we went ahead and turned it off. In the meantime, I had some butter warming in the Dutch oven that you're seeing there. I'm getting these onions put in so they can go ahead and start to sweat down and soften a little bit. And I actually like them to caramelize just a bit before I move on, but again, that's personal preference. In addition to these onions, I pulled out some poblano peppers that I had put away and pre-chopped from last year's garden season and put just a couple in. I'm really glad I didn't put more in. I thought with leaving out some of the stronger spices that the recipe called for, I could go for just a few and I was right. It turned out pretty spicy even just with what I have done, but I'll tell you more about what we left out in a minute. Now, they actually call for tomato with green chilies or kind of like a rotel in the recipe, but my kids didn't need the extra spice, so I just used my immersion blender to chop up some tomatoes that I had canned whole back in the summer. Giving this a good stir, you can kind of see they're starting to sweat down there, and then I went ahead and added the garlic. After one minute of the garlic just becoming fragrant, I added the rest of the ingredients to the pot to get this thing cranking. Now, the ingredients that you're going to see me add include chicken stock, the enchilada sauce, corn, beans, and the chicken itself. If you want to make this recipe but do not have pre-canned chicken, that's totally fine. The recipe was actually written that way, which again is down below. You just have to make sure to simmer the chicken inside the broth until it is completely cooked, pull it out, then shred it, and put it back into the recipe before completion. 
That's the value of having the canned items already on the shelf is that you can skip a lot of that, save some time in the actual cooking process and move forward getting this food on the table sooner than later, which is exactly what I needed to do with all of the kids starting to get pretty hungry. Now take a look at the little one over there. She is actually using a price tag as a phone and she's giving me a call pretending like we're having a conversation. There is never a shortage of entertainment going on when she's around, so she just wants to make a quick FaceTime call here, give me a shout, and then we're going to get right back into it. Once this is all complete, then all you have to do is go ahead and stir in those seasonings, get it completely incorporated, and then I brought this up to a slight simmer, got everything warm, and turned it off. I did not want to get it super, super hot into like a heavy boil because I wanted to be able to put the cheese in without breaking it and getting a weird kind of grainy texture in the final finished product. So once it cooled just slightly, I went ahead and stirred in some cheddar cheese. The recipe does call for pepper jack, but once I tested out the spiciness of this, I decided that we did not need the pepper jack in here, so we skipped that. We did go ahead and add four ounces of pre-softened cream cheese. And then once that was fully incorporated, this beauty was complete and ready to go. Once the cheeses were completely melted, I was ready to serve. So I tend to go ahead and get everybody bowled up or plated up before I call them in to eat. I just find that it's a lot more simple when I have so many mouths to feed and it also gives me the opportunity to sit down as well and enjoy the meal instead of running around and getting everybody's plates full. So what I did to plate this up was go ahead and add the soup and sour cream for all but one. I have one guy that just is not a big sour cream fan in his soup, so we did skip for him. I think with the soup and the spiciness of it, a little bit more sour cream was good because it helped to mellow out the flavor. Once that was complete, I crumbled up a few tortilla chips on top and we got these over to the table and ready to go. I will admit I was slightly nervous about this one, but everybody asked for seconds. My littlest two asked for thirds and that one with a thumb up could not wait to tell me that she wanted to have that for lunch the next day. So all in, we will definitely eat that again. One thing I will do is modify the amount of chili powder that I put in the seasoning blend itself, but it was so, so good and we had it for leftovers and that is always a win for me. With our first recipe complete, can I ask you for a favor really quick? If you are enjoying your time here at the Hometown Homestead, can you make sure to hit the like and subscribe button and also turn on notifications? I put out new videos one to two times a week and I'm typically in the kitchen and doing something with the kids. So if this kind of content is something that you're enjoying, please do that. It really helps out my channel more than you know. I'm on the march to 5,000 subscribers and I cannot wait to hit those milestones and many, many more. The second meal that I wanna make for you is something that is really, really, really a favorite around here, which is pulled pork sliders. Now, if you watched me in the Canuary series sponsored by Sutton's Days, you know that I did a pork butt in the jars and I got so many questions about one, what to do with it and two, how it tasted since I seared off the edges. And today I'm gonna use it for these sandwiches and it's just, it's really, really good meat and we are super happy with it. Now, I could have purchased the Hawaiian buns at the store, but I wanted to try to make them myself. So what you're seeing here is my version of a King's Hawaiian roll, which I actually got off the King Arthur website. I will put that link down in the description. So if you're considering making something like this at home, you can definitely do that just by following along with their recipe. I will say that in my mixer, I went ahead and mixed everything up using the roller and scraper option, but the recipe on the King Arthur site does give differing directions. If you're using something like a KitchenAid, you do have to use a couple different attachments during the processing time because this is a really high hydration dough. It actually has pineapple juice in it, meaning that you need to start with something other than the dough hook before you're able to move to that once it kind of starts to come together. This recipe itself will make 16 rolls and to create the little balls, what you wanna do is get them rolled in your hand and then make sure that you're creating some tension as you're rolling by pinching and pulling the excess underneath the roll itself. That process of creating the tension is what gives you that beautiful top to the rolls once they are complete. 
Once you have all 16 complete, you put a lid on the rolls themselves so they can take an hour and a half to two hours to go ahead and rise and get a little bit puffy before moving on to an egg wash. This wash itself is just the egg white and as you can see, my tiny assistant is really feeling like she should be the one getting this accomplished. I did go ahead and convince her that she could hold off and let me do all of them but the last one. So that is what you see her helping with right here. Once the wash is complete, these go in the oven on 350 until they reach an internal temperature of 190 degrees. While the rolls are in process, I went ahead and got the pulled pork out so we can get it into the pot and seasoned up ready to go. My first step was to drain off the majority of the juice. The amount of juice that's in there would be way too much and make your pork really soupy, which is definitely not the goal with a sandwich. We didn't want to soak the bread up with that juice. So I set it aside and I'll use it later this week for another recipe I have coming down the road. Once the pork is in, I turned on the heat and got it coming up to temperature so I could go ahead and get it simmering and pull out any extra moisture that was in there in order to just have it as dry as I was looking for. We also went ahead and added a barbecue sauce straight to the mix. The amount of barbecue sauce that you add is really up to you. I tend to like to go a little bit lighter at this point, giving everybody the option to add as much or little as they want down the road when it's actually on their sandwich. So give a little bit of sauce to it, give it a stir, see what you think, and then let it sit there and simmer and reduce down getting rid of the excess water while the rolls are cooking. Over on the counter, one of my other helpers was going ahead and getting the cheese sliced up so we had it ready to go for our sandwiches. And I thought he was helping, now I'm seeing he's actually eating some, uh, but he won't be the only one to steal off that cutting board before the final product comes out. Those rolls weren't quite done, so I did go ahead and put them right back in, but my little one needed a little bit of love and she is very, very, very set that she's the only one who should set the kitchen timer, so she had to jump over there and do her part. Now, we are gonna go ahead and make some mayo for the potato salad while the rest of the ingredients are finishing up over on the stove. So the mayo is really actually super easy once I learned how to do it. You need egg, salt, vinegar, mustard, and a little lemon juice, as well as some avocado oil and an immersion blender, and you are good to go. I will link this recipe down in the description as well. Once I found it, it really was helpful. This one calls for a three quarters cup of oil instead of one cup which some of the ones I had tried previously had called for and I never had good luck with them being thick enough. So I really do like the smaller amounts listed in this specific recipe from Melissa K. Norris, which I'll make sure to put down below. With the mayo complete, it's time to move on with the rest of the potato salad. So I went ahead and grabbed two quarts of potatoes at first, and then as I was draining them off, I realized I could probably start with one. So we used one quart of potatoes, drained first, and then I went ahead and chopped them until they were the size that we would like for a potato salad. I will say, once I got this on my plate, I wish I had chopped it up a little bit more, but it really just depends on your personal preference. I find that the smaller the piece, the more coating you get on the outside of the actual sauce, which is exactly what a couple of my kids wanted, but the others asked for thirds, so it really just depends on your personal liking. Using home canned potatoes for potato salad is actually one of my favorite ways to use them. I find that they come out of those jars so tender. As you can see here, even my butter knife is just cutting right through them. Now I did not follow a recipe for this potato salad. I just kind of threw together some ingredients that we liked. There are many, many, many variations of a potato salad online, but some of them have ingredients that might or might not be right for your family. So I used the mayo that you saw us make, some mustard, some vinegar, just a tiny bit, a good amount of salt, and then some chives and gave this a good stir before turning my attention back to the rolls. As you can see, they turned out really, really pretty. I did have to put them back in a couple times because the temperature just wasn't reaching 190 internal with the amount of time that the recipe called for. So I really would recommend that you use a digital thermometer to check when you're making breads. I find that they turn out a little bit doughy if they're undercooked. And since we're using these as a sandwich bread, 
I didn't want them to have any dough to them at all. I wanted it to actually be really nice bread that we could use for our sandwiches. With the rolls out of the pan, we took them over to the counter and went ahead to assemble. The first step, of course, is to go ahead and get those rolls cut open. And then I like to put the cheese down first. With the cheese down, I then add the pulled pork and topped it off with some homemade sauerkraut that I had made a few weeks ago, and it turned out just so good. These sandwiches were a huge hit, and we went ahead and served them aside some of that beautiful potato salad. I have personally found that having proteins on the shelf ready to go when you are in a pinch and need to put something together really fast is a huge time saver and the ultimate fast food. If the meal like this would make you as happy as it made my crew, make sure to check out the links I'm gonna add at the end on how to get that pork or the chicken in the jars. But for now, I wanna thank you for stopping by the Hometown Homestead. Make sure to subscribe on your way out and I hope to see you back really soon. Bye friends.